Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Bob Booth. He is the Chief Care Officer for Timely Care. Bob, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me, Nick. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So as I do with all my uh, guests, I always try and get a little bit of context uh, for, for their history. And I've got to be frank, um, you know, as I was setting this up, I'm looking at you and you're a physician, but you're a gas man or an anesthetist, anesthesiologist. What is a gas man doing in this space? Tell us your story. Well, I, I think that's a uh, that's a fun way to get started because it doesn't uh, doesn't completely make sense uh, on paper. Um, I often joke with people I overpaid for my dog. You know, it, when you put two or three different breeds together now to get a designer dog, you pay more money, but one more species away and you've got a mutt. I think I'm actually getting pretty close to being a mutt uh, in my experience. Uh, my my background um, uh, started out in higher education. Um, I actually spent some time there between um, my uh, undergraduate degree, um, which was in a humanities theology field uh, in, in pursuing a degree in counseling psychology, uh, working in higher education. Now, at the time, I had no idea I was going to um, to to become a leader in the higher education space. Uh, I was trying to pay the bills, um, but I worked uh, in residence life and in student affairs while pursuing uh, a degree in counseling psychology. Um, from that point on, I went on to medical school and then uh, anesthesiology. Um, now, what's interesting from that point is I worked for a large national anesthesia management company over the last eight years and helped work um, with some other academic institutions, uh, Duke, the University College of London, to help develop a perioperative medicine fellowship that looked at value-based um, care, uh, that looked at what are we doing to improve the actual outcomes so my experience over in the anesthesia space on the leadership side, looking at operational efficiencies, looking at growing quality in a network, working on advancing our field, gave me up perfectly for moving into higher education. So um, now over at the current spot that I sit um, as the chief care officer of Timely Care, I am actively working to grow a provider network that produces high quality that delivers value from an outbase measurement standpoint uh, to our students. And so that's where the intersection kind of all weaves together. But uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I'm not using the, uh, the, the anesthetist part of my career. I, you know, I, I'm going to disagree with you uh, on, on your use case, in part because I think there are so many elements that contribute to um, what you're doing in in this educational space, but maybe not in the traditional sense. So you're not thinking about the the drugs and flow of gas and uh, you know in those elements, but you do think about it critically in the same way that you know it's constant monitoring, understanding of that data and the processing. So um, I think you know I got to be honest, you're underselling that connection a little bit, um, and, and that brings me to the, the the sort of the core of this. So. What is it that you do and, and how did you get involved? What was the sort of pathway into um, being the chief care officer at Timely Care? Well, I, th I think that's a great segue to that piece. And, and I, I will uh, agree with you there that we have to be data driven, right? We have to look at, at what's going on around us. So um, my pathway to Timely Care was moving some of those uh, those lessons learned over in the anesthesia space to look over in this space and ask the question, uh, what do we need? Uh, what, what's going on in the space? So we start by listening to our students um, to understand what our students are telling us. Our students tell us eight out of 10 students say there's a full-blown mental health campus, uh, Full, excuse me, eight out of two, 10 students will tell us that there is a full-blown mental health crisis going on on their campus. 
mental health is the number one reason why students abandon their academic goals while they quit and, and have to leave school. This is incredibly uh, alarming for any of us that are listening to that. This is something that we have to really pay attention to. Um, and that data is 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 out there now coming across um, multiple avenues. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, the February data from the CDC looking at uh, mental health for teens. Uh, just alarming. Teenage girls, three out of five have persistent sadness over the course of 2021. One out of three considered suicide. Um, they did a great job. New York Times did a really good job of, of covering some of the data. Um, if anybody wants to go back and look at that in February, uh, they, they point out the, the boys aren't left out here. Um, it's actually that for mental health uh, in young men, it's, it's not actually presented with sadness as much as it's presented as aggression and irritability. And then they go on to talk about some of our most vulnerable populations and the LGBTQ um, group is, is one we really have to pay attention to with significantly increased exposure to violence, depression, suicidal ideation. That's the data that we're looking at, right? That's the, that's the problem to solve. And so when you talk a little bit about like, what's my role, what, what happens at Timely Care? Um, timely Care exists to be a virtual solution. We are the leading virtual solution for student mental health and well-being, and we are working to create access to care through virtual solutions to address that data that I, that I spoke to you about so far. So we sit at that intersection. We work and partner with the university. So our partners are people who are passionate about the problem that I just described. They come to us, over 250 schools now, um, they come to us and um, ask us to be an extension of the care that they're already giving to their students. And so my role as the as the chief care officer uh, is to help lead a really talented team of people. Um, they're trying to address this data and trying to shift shift the trend. So I, I'm I'm just going to go back. I mean, normally I'm I'm sort of relatively animated, but I, I've got to be quite frank that the the level of depression i feel with those statistics is just jaw dropping when you consider 8 out of 10 people are in that state of mind and this is our youth the people that should be looking out and saying wow i've got my whole life opportunity ahead something terrible has happened before we dive into you know how we approach that what we can do about it let me ask you, you know, just for a little bit of context, has that, did, I, I mean, I think that number must have gotten worse in the pandemic. Was that increase or worsening significant or was it just, you know, more of the same, but just a little bit more? What What's your sense of that? Uh, yes. The CDC said yes. Yes, uh, that's, that's the, that was the lead um, in what they were saying on that. But but that's not it's not the cause. You know, I frequently will tell people uh, there was a, there was a, a wildfire that was already raging around mental health and young people mm. pre pandemic. The pandemic was just gasoline. Um, so it, it, it functioned as an accelerant. If there's a silver lining, it actually opened our global eyes to the issue of what's going on, because at one point in time, globally, we all experienced at the same time that compression of isolation, of uh, fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. of uh, lack of resources, um, just so many things that hit all of us. I think that probably opened our eyes to something that we know has been going on for a while. Mm. And, and that's what the data tells us. Since 2011, they do this same survey, 17,000 students every two years. It's, it, it's gotten worse progressively over and over again. We weren't talking about COVID in 2011. We weren't talking about COVID in 2019. So, so what is it that's underlying this? And I think what I'll tell you, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure you, you're, you're probably already connecting the dots here, is that we just added stress um, to an already vulnerable and stressed um, group of people. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I 100 percent, I, I think the, the, the presence of this has been 
uh, around for a, an extensive period of time. And you're right. I mean, I've talked about this. It's almost it, it's difficult to say, but silver lining to a pandemic that we all look back and go, whoa. But it truly was. It did. It shone a spotlight. It, it allowed more sort of uh, focus and attention, which all is good. There is a little bit of a concern, certainly on my part. It's this flash in the pan, short attention span, new cycle. Oh, yeah, that was there. Oh, the pandemic's over. We don't need to worry about that. But hoping that that's not the case, let's talk a little bit about how we deal with this. And, you know, I'm just going to throw down some straightforward issues and concerns in this area we already lack resources. I mean, I, I don't think you're sitting there going, oh, well, we've got lots of resources to throw about at, at, at this and, you know, help start to mitigate it. That's just not the case. How do you start to approach this when you sit in this resource poor environment? Well, so I'm going to agree with you and then I'm going to reframe something mm -hmm. into the positive. So we cannot staff our way out of this. Uh, there, there, uh, uh, we could dump buckets of money into training, into uh, increasing compensation, you know, all the things. And we still have a supply demand mismatch. Here's the reframe. That's going to force us to do something innovative, right? That actually forces us to think about this differently. And, and I'm flashing back just real quick to a, a physician from um, uh, from your side of the pond um, that it really impacted the way I thought about this was uh, a man by the name of, of Dr. Monty Mython, who um, through the University College of London, who looked at constraining budgetary um, uh, issues with how do we improve care? Well, I have less money to do this within the NHS. And that spun out of a really robust and incredible enhanced recovery after surgery program that uh, many of us have been trying to copy for, for years. So what's happening in the middle health space? Same thing. Okay, this is so bad. We have to do something different. And that's forcing innovation. And that's forcing us to look at things differently. So from our vantage point at Timely Care, that's providing virtual care solutions to students. This is not a nine to five problem. This is a 24-7 problem. Students lead 24-7 lifestyles. 40% of our students come to us after hours. That's times when clinics are going to be closed, right, and, and unavailable, um, and yet they're still needing care. The students who are on campus today, they're digital natives. They, 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 they were practically born with a phone in their hand. So why, why wouldn't we go to them where they already are? Why wouldn't we go to them in a, uh, in a manner in which they're already connecting to help get them connected. The next thing I think I would say there is we can't just think of this as a sick care model. That's what's failed us in healthcare, right? Is if we're just waiting until pathology develops and running after it, what's happening at a population health level? Our entire population is getting sicker and sicker. Our workforce is getting more and more burned out. Speaking of accelerants during COVID, look what it's done to the burnout crisis uh, with healthcare providers, right? Um, but if a sick care model is a spiral to, to, to insolvency, it's just, it won't work. Right. Um, and so we have to treat people when they're subclinical, we have to provide resources to people before it gets so bad that they're persistently sad all year long, thinking about harming themselves. And so the timely care solution for that and the way that we've approached this as we said, okay, let's improve access to care um, for students who are who are in crisis. Let's you know improve access to care um, for students who have acute medical care needs. But how do we widen the top of the funnel so that students can start thinking about what care looks like um, when they're feeling meh, when they're feeling like eh, things just aren't right? I can't name even what's going on, but I know something's there. And so we've layered in a peer community where students can anonymously talk to each other. And this has been a drastic inertia reducing component of what it is that we do. And yet many students even find that that's enough for them. 50% of our students who engage and, and we're, we're clearly 
we started this in August, we're hundreds of thousands in on our level of engagement on the, on the peer community. Uh, some of them go there and they seek support and they give support to each other and, and that's it. That helps them get through what they're going through. Um, others from there may need other additional layers of care. And that's why we recently launched our self-care journeys. So this is digital content in bite-sized formats, the same way that students are already consuming information. I keep saying students, I'm consuming information this way. Show me something I can learn in 60 seconds and I'll watch 10 of them in a row without even realizing I'm learning, right? So we've got short bite-sized video components from some of our expert psychiatrists and mental health leaders telling students how to think about stress allowing them to do their own self-assessments about stress and then giving them coping skills so that they can begin to start working in this way um, with digital content that's scalable and is not correlated to that supply-demand mismatch that we talked about earlier. So that's a, that's a handful of examples of how we're approaching it. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today, I'm talking to Bob Booth. He is the chief care officer at Timely Care. We were just talking about the devastating uh, circumstance and the opportunity to sort of use technology um, to really expand access. I think, you know, the addition of that capability and the mutual support, obviously a slightly different circumstance and uh, that, that you find in uh, traditional social uh, circles where it's not so much support as look at me. I'm doing all this wonderful stuff, I, I think, you know, has partly contributed to it. But I, I'm wondering how you've managed to sort of create a solution that allows for that, but doesn't devolve into negativity where people, you know, sometimes I, I, that's what we've seen in some of these circumstances, because I think it is, it's that mutual support. You said 50%, that's a large number of people that are deriving benefit. How have you able to manage that within the, the framework that you have? You know, I think it's really important to look at the full picture of, of who the student is, like who the person is. So I started by telling you some, some, some data points to tell you where we're starting at. The data points are, are concerning. Um, they're alarming. But there's hope. And there's optimism, and really, there's a great deal of, of hope and optimism uh, with the patient population that we really serve. And that is that there's a lot of underlying resiliency in our students. Yeah, oh, look at what happened after the pandemic. Guess what? These are also students who are still in school after the pandemic. Many of our uh, college-age students right now missed the prototypical junior and senior year 11th and 12th grade experience uh, in high school. And what did they do? They still showed up on campus. Uh, many of our seniors, right, had incredibly disrupted, um, uh, you know, first year and second year experience that was going on. But what are they doing? They're still pursuing their goals. So we talk about at-risk populations, and sometimes we even use the word vulnerable. Be careful. This is a really, really strong group. And so what does that mean? That means that when that group needs help, the little bit of help that we can give, and I'm arguing giving a whole lot more help, but, but sometimes it just takes little bits, little prods, little bits of encouragement have exponential effects, right? And that's what we're leveraging. And that's what gets me excited, right? That's why I get up and come to work every day. That's why my team is so excited within the care organization. And that's really what drives timely care in general is that we know that the work that we do today has legacy level impact in people's families. Because when you finish school, it changes your, socio your socioeconomic position, right? Your earning capabilities, your ability to um, interact and, and add value back into society. Um, one out of 10 of all of our, our students that we take care of are in community colleges. Oftentimes, those community colleges are in rural areas where that community college is the hub. What happens when we keep a community college student who may be caring for elder parents at home, maybe a single parent, um, working other jobs? What if we can give them the support that they need to meet their goals? That actually changes an entire community. So not just the individual, not just the family, not just generational, but changes their entire community. That's the positive, right? That's what gets exciting. That's, that's what helps us continue to evolve and innovate. 
So you, you've clearly focused on, you know, what I would call the younger generation, although you yourself talked about accessing and, you know, you, you're you not, I'm guessing you're not a digital native, but you've inserted yourself into that, that world, like I have. I mean, I, I absorb it, but I see peers and, you know, different age groups. Is part of the acceptance and that resilience that you describe, which, you know, is is gratifying to hear, and I think you're right, it's, you know, emphasis on the positive, is part of that it, it built in because they're digital natives? And is that something that we can transfer into other groups? Because, uh, as you pointed out earlier on, it's not just confined here. It's, you know, across large communities. Because what you really want is to take this and expand it to a, as broad a population as possible. Because I think everybody feels this in some fashion or another, no matter where they are and what age they are. I completely agree. I think we're just talking about the early adopters. Right. That, that's really what's going on here. Um, I've been very fortunate in my position to get to interact with other people who are doing some of the same things in, in our space. And, you know, uh, we have people who are leveraging virtual care solutions uh, for end of life and geriatric care. So I, we're doing it. Uh, people are doing it. Um, there may be some obvious things that you need to do to uh, make sure that your technological solution is designed or who's using it, we've been incredibly intentional about this. It, you know, it is very much the, the content we deliver, the training we deliver, everything is, 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 is college students, college students, college students. But that doesn't mean that you can't have different personas in mind as you design. So um, I, I like to think of them as early adopters. I also like to think that they're, they're pushing us towards our tipping point um uh to to help leverage that out across uh other populations and other avenues so i i think you know great great way of sort of conceptualizing this this is you know it's it, it, uh, refine it for different groups and you know, you know the opportunity um I, I'll, I'll be frank i mean in a, a an ideal world we wouldn't need this service we would all be happy and you know i i don't know if that's even possible i'm i'm, I'm not sure is you know, is happiness a constant state? I don't think it is, you know, and you appreciate the world if you don't have happiness. But if you were to think about the future and sort of, I, I don't want to say get doing yourself out of a job, what what do you see as the sort of future trajectory of this um, going forward? And, you know, I, I obviously access is important, but you know, is there some scope to try and drive back to origins and, you know, deal with I, you know the the root cause potentially. Certainly, I think there's there's uh, two paths there. One is looking back, and one is uh, is looking forward. In that, so uh, we should never stop trying to identify uh, what puts people at risk. What what are we tolerating in society that is hurting us? That is creating um, this unsustainable pattern. Um, so let's let's take a left eye towards the past right eye towards the future, where do we need to go? Um, it's really building off that idea of not being able to staff our way out of this. Uh, it's not being able to professional organization our way out of this as well, too. Um, we have to uh, change the lexicon around how we talk about this. And we have to look at not just leveraging students and leveraging peer communities. But if we're going to get better here, we have to help everyone become a supporter. Um, we really got to have uh, that mindset that this is not just a problem for uh, teenage girls or uh, seniors in college. Um, this is all of our um, a problem to solve. And therefore, we need to empower people to help each other out. That's the society we all want to live in, right? I think we we would all do a better job if we could figure out how to uh, make ourselves obsolete um, for the uh, for us in this space right here. I think that means leveraging every single resource you possibly have, and 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 creating somebody else who's going to go out there and do the same as well, so that we have an exponential impact. So I think a great way to to sort of close out, I'll, I'll just supplement that with something that I've, you know, long held a bee in my bonnet, I'll be frank. It, it's, you know, this term mental, I struggle with, I, I've 
tried to sort of pivot to brain health, you know, a disease mm -hmm. uh, issue, not had much success. I wish we would. We've had success with other terminology and, you know, push away and the acceptance that this is no different to a cold, um, a viral infection, um, you know, cancer, any of those things. It is just another condition and we really have to pivot. Unfortunately, as we do uh, each and every uh, other week, we've run out of time. Um, just remains for me to thank you for joining me on the show today. Bob, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Nick, for the time. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. Evolution.